Hi, everybody. This is Big Anklevich. And Rish Outfield. Welcome. I, this is an uh, extra thing. It's not like our usual show or anything. Uh, but we have a little something for you. A little something something for you. That's a sexual reference that I just don't get, doesn't it? Uh, maybe. Every time you say, I, I showed my neighbor's wife a little something something, I say... Well, I don't understand. Like a like a like a, a magic trick? Or you 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 jump started her car? I jumped something something. I'm like, what? <laughs> Are you? Do you stutter? What? Is- <laughs> yep, that's what it is. Uh, so yeah, what we've got for you today? We've been talking about the, our experience at the New Media Expo for the last little while, uh, giving you bits and pieces. Reeling you in. It's like the the trail that Hansel, I was going to say Hans and Gretel, that Hansel and Gretel left of the breadcrumbs so they could find their way back. But then the birds ate it, so they died. No, no, they grew up to be witch hunters. Did you not see how that tremendously successful movie? I forgot about that. But anyways, yeah, uh, we've got another breadcrumb for you here for the birds to eat. This is one of the two panels that people who have appeared on the Dune Steve podcast presented at the New Media Expo. Uh, this panel here is the first panel of the day. Ours was the second. The first panel of the day included Renee Chambliss, as well as Brian Lincoln and Marshall Latham. Yeah, Renee uh, was the moderator, you'd say? She, she sort of prepared the content. Yeah, she had clips. She had a lot of stuff uploaded and ready to go. And uh, the subject was tone and emotion, the keys to compelling podcast fiction narration. And in an upcoming That Gets My my Goat, I'm going to start talking about my work or my attempt to do audiobook work. And uh, actually, some of the things they said on this in this panel were really helpful to me in this week of trying to do audio books. Uh, they mentioned a couple of things that never occurred to me. She mentions a couple of tricks that she knows. Um, one of them is the the levitating woman. But, uh, you know, the sort of things that, that help you make a professional sounding reading. And so if you're a podcaster or if you read audiobooks or you want to be one of those people that you haven't tried it yet, this is a good thing to listen to. It's very instructive. Even someone has been around the block as Rish Outfield learned something new from it. So yeah, check it out and uh, enjoy. Here's the, uh, the panel. Hello. Thank you. I'm uh, Renee Chambliss, and I'm going to introduce my co-panelists in a minute. I am an audiobook narrator, and I'm used to being alone in my closet, not speaking in front of an audience. So please bear with me, although I see lots of friends, so (laughs) that helps, definitely. Um, What we're talking about is doing effective, compelling audiobook or audio fiction narration in podcast. This could translate over to other kinds of podcasting. It's basically when you're reading as opposed to just talking off the cuff. Okay, so first we have Brian Lincoln here. He is very involved in the podcast fiction world. He's participated in lots of different podcasts, and um, I'm going to let him tell you a little bit about himself. Uh, Sure. Uh, I would say that I'm classified as an audio producer. I do a lot of uh, different things, but I think in terms of narration, uh, I do audio fiction short stories with a full cl- full cast. Um, I am a regular contributor to the Dune Steep Audio Fiction Magazine, and I contribute to other shows as well. Um, I do a podcast about how to do full cast audio. Uh, I'm also a narrator on ACX through ACX.com. Uh, and I do audio drama. I'm um, part of the production team for HG World, which is a zombie audio drama. So I, I put my hand in a lot of different areas, so to speak, uh, and it all kind of ties together as, a, as an audio producer. So We also have with us Marshall Latham, who has a great fiction podcast that he can tell us about. Well, I've, uh, <laughs> I've been a fan of uh, fiction podcasts for probably about six years or so. And I uh, listened to, to various podcasts. And uh, eventually I started wanting to do some of it myself. 
and uh, got involved um, doing, uh, starting producing podcasts myself, uh, fiction podcasts on a uh, uh, fan site uh, of a of the Drabblecast, and um, they uh, they had it basically started from their forums a uh, a brand new fan website called the Dribblecast, which was anybody could could take any story that was on the forums and produce that in any way they wanted to. And I just kind of started doing that. And then I got involved also with the uh, Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine, producing long, bigger stories, full cast stories. Um, I got a lot of um, good experience doing that. Um, for them. And then eventually I caught the bug. I wanted to do it myself. I wanted to, to produce my own show. I wanted, to, I, uh, I have the Journey Into um, podcast. And on, on Journey Into, I feature full cast audio drama. And I also do some uh, replay old radio shows, old radio dramas um, from other shows. And so, in in doing that, I've I've picked up different different uh, tips and tricks. And uh, great, sure. thanks, you guys. My name is Renee Channels. I'm a little different because I don't have my own podcast, <laughs> but I have participated in many. I'm a writer first, and I had written. A novel that I wanted to get an audience for and I heard about podcast novels and patio books and so I thought you know I love to read aloud I thought that's something I could do so I read my novel it's called dreaming of deliverance I put it up on patio books and you know I hoped and expected that people would get involved in the story and would kind of talk to me about that and that did happen which was great but what also started happening was people from other podcasts. Actually, Brian was one of the first, started asking me to read for them, read other stories, not things that I had written. And that evolved into participating in a lot of different fiction podcasts, both as a narrator and as a voice actress doing different characters. And that has led me to professional audiobook narration. And I'm not sure how many I've done, 15 or 20 maybe now. Um, so that's what we want to talk about today, is how to narrate well, whether you're doing your own writing or you're reading for somebody else. Um, and so let's get to it. There's one thing that people seem to think is absolutely necessary to be a good audio fiction narrator. You know what? I can't, I can't do this. I can't read books anymore. Books on tape have ruined me, Jerry. I need that nice voice. This book has my voice. I hate my voice. So get this book on tape. You can't. It's a textbook. Hey, excuse me. I, I'm sorry to bother you. I, I noticed that you have a textbook on tape. May, may I ask where you got that? Reading for the blind. They can get any book on tape. I, I tell you, I am hooked on these uh, books on tape. Don't tell me about it. These things have ruined me for real. <laughs> the blind i take an eye test i flunk it the next thing you know i am swinging to the sweet sounds of risk management <laughs> chapter one in order to manage risk we must first understand risk how do you spot risk how do you avoid risk and what makes it so risky this guy sounds to just like me risk, we must first define this is risk. risk is the system Okay, so do you want great audio fiction narration for your podcast? You do. But you don't need to have a great voice. And that's the thing that I think a lot of people get stuck on. They're like, I don't like my voice. I don't sound very good. I have always hated my voice. I'm coming around to it a little bit more. But, um, but you don't need to have a good voice. That is not the most important element to good narration. And in fact, sometimes some of the really amazing radio type people with these beautiful voices don't do a very good job because they're sort of relying just on their voices. So in my opinion, and I've been talking with these guys too, and they agree, it's the tone and the emotion of the reading that you put into it that is the key to making great narration. So what we're going to go over today is we're going to talk about what you need to do before you record because that is really important is to be prepared before you start your reading. We're going to talk about what to do during the reading to get good results. And we're going to talk about what you can do afterwards to polish it up. 
and then we'll have questions. So before you get started, before you press record, what do you need to do? In my opinion, the most important thing is to know the story. This is easy to do when you have written the story. You can skip this step. <laughs> but when you haven't, you really need to know and understand the story to be able to bring it to life. And we have, so you need to read the story first. Sounds like a no-brainer, but it's something that people don't always do. You know, I'll admit that in the early days, I didn't always read, and I had a couple of times where I wished I had read it first because then I would have said, no, I'm not going to do this. <laughs> so that just for your own protection, that's an important thing to do, but also to just know what, know what you're going to be communicating. That will give you an idea what the tone should be. Okay, now we're going to do an example, and Marshall can tell us a little more about this because this happened with his podcast. Do you want me to play the example first, or do you want to talk about it uh, first? I'll set it up a little bit. Okay. Um, so, so basically, th there was a, a story um, by D.K. Thompson called God-Shaped Box, and the essential part of the story is this couple, their son had, was, uh, had died or nearly died, and they had frozen him. And they had, you know, it, it's, of course, fantasy science fiction, but they had captured God into this small snow globe type box, and they had harnessed a lot of the, the power of God for themselves to be able to bring their son back. And there's a lot of sad elements to this story, and one, but one of the key elements is, is that they, with this power, they, they, they tuned their brains to only be happy all the time because their emotions were getting in the way, so they, they, got, they made themselves happy all the time. And so when reading the story, I, I got um, a Lauren Santoro, who's an excellent narrator. He's done a lot of narration, and he uh, has, is a host of his own podcast as well. But uh, I asked him to do the story, and when he sent me the recordings back, he sent me two different recordings. He said, I did this narration the first time through, but I missed a key element. I missed the part that they had programmed their brains to always be happy. And so he read it, and in those sad portions of the script he was very very sad and uh, you know as a father would be for his son and his wife and things like that and so um after he keyed on to that he reread it and he actually enjoyed the reading of it a lot better um the second time through because he knew the story better um so I, we have kind of um the first take and the second take, and you'll see the difference in emotion and how important that was. Yeah, it sounds almost like a totally different story. So it's it's not a super long clip, but it definitely will give you an idea. Sometimes Adam's little body would twitch on the table. Once the shock of it even opened up his eyes. But no matter what we did, we, we, we couldn't bring him back. That devastated us. Sometimes Adam's little body would twitch on the table. Once the shock of it even opened his eyes. But no matter what we did, we, we couldn't bring him back. It devastated us. So isn't that amazing? Just to, like what a huge difference. It's the exact same words, same reader, but it sounds totally different. And one is appropriate to the story and one isn't. Now, if you're given something to read, sometimes it might be, it might not be clear just from the text what the proper tone should be. So this is... And we're going to kind of go back and forth between talking about if you're working for another producer versus if you're doing it yourself. If you're doing it yourself, you get to make all those decisions. But if you're working for another producer, you might need to get some information about how they want you to do it. Um, this is me doing a reading for the Drabblecast, um, which is a great short fiction podcast. If you aren't familiar with it, check it out. And... This was a story about the end of the world. Basically, everyone's fleeing the earth because it's just out of resources and it's about to, um, I don't know, blow up or something. So they're all blasting off into space. And it cuts between that narrative back to this voice of a woman taking a picture of an orange. And she takes pictures over time as the orange kind of rots. And so you're cutting back and forth between what's happening in the story versus her description of what's happening to the orange. There's supposed to be parallels there. So my job was to be the talking about the orange. And 
when I first did it, I did it very serious because what's happening with the world is terrible. But then I got to thinking about some, um, I went to school in biology and some of my biology professors who would study, like they'd be ant experts say, and they'd be so interested and they'd be describing their ants, things that most people would just be disgusted by, but they love them. And so I thought, well, that might be kind of interesting to do it. Like she's really interested in what's happening to this orange. So um, I did it both ways and I told Norm Sherman, the producer, that he could pick, and I wasn't sure which way he'd want to go, but he could pick. Um, so you can hear the difference. I take time-lapse photographs of an orange. The result is always the same. First, I remove the previous orange from the spike in front of the black velvet backdrop and replace it with a new orange. I set an incandescent spotlight out of frame as a light source. I take time-lapse photographs of an orange. The result is always the same. First, I remove the previous orange from the spike in front of the black velvet backdrop and replace it with a new orange. I set an incandescent spotlight out of frame as a light so oh, that cut off. What was interesting was I expected him to use either one version or the other. He ended up using both versions. At the beginning of the story, before we realized just how horrible everything is, he used the upbeat version. But then at the end, when everything is just a disaster, he switched it over to the somber version, which was, it ended up being very effective. Um, but I hadn't, you know, even thought that could be a possibility. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about characters. Um, we have different types of audio fiction productions that we do. One is the straight read or solo narration, where it's just one person doing all of the description, all of the voices. We also have full cast, which both Marshall and Brian um, are experts in, where you have a narrator, but then each character has a different voice, and often it's a different actor doing each part. If you are doing the whole reading yourself, this part applies to you because you need to know your characters. This is a pet peeve of mine with writers also. They're like, okay, I need a girlfriend character. So they just kind of write, you know, this sort of um, one dimensional girlfriend. But each person has their own life unto themselves and they're going to be different. And so really try to know and understand them. And it could work with full cast also if you're playing one of these roles. You, know, you want to know the person. So who are they? Are they as they seem? Or is there something going on under the surface? Because that can affect how you do the reading. What are their motivations? And you, basically, you just need to understand them. OK, the next one is doesn't seem, at first glance, like it would have much to do with tone and uh, emotion. But we talk a little bit about pronunciations. How does knowing the proper pronunciation help with tone and emotion? Basically, you want to have them down so that you don't have to think about them when you're doing the reading. So if you have any doubt about how something is pronounced, and I've had, I don't know if you guys have had this happen, but I, I've had some really, ones I thought, um, the word T-O-U-S-L-E-D, like with hair, I always thought was tousled, but apparently the actual correct pronunciation is tousled which I had, uh, you know, some people are pickier than others. Probably most podcast fiction people wouldn't be that picky, but you know, in the professional audiobook world, they are. So, <laughs> so you might be surprised at kind of how things are pronounced. Um, one thing I do, I don't know if you guys do this differently, but I, if I have a lot of like really difficult words, I insert them phonetically in a way that I'll understand within the actual body of the text. So do you yeah, when I did, a, I did a story recently that was set in New Orleans and there were few words, especially street names, that I was like, how, how do you say this? And it's a, a street called Chapitula Street mm -hmm. or something like that. I think I just said it wrong, actually. But um, I, when I got that story, um, I was very careful uh, before I accepted it to um, talk to the author and make sure that I was going to be comfortable with it. Because the last thing I want to do is just botch somebody's story and not, not do what they want. So once I sort of realized that she was communicative and I was able to go, go back and forth and be comfortable with with saying things correctly then uh, went ahead with it and it all went great but 
uh, it was very important to me to go through the story first mm -hmm. and make sure that I wasn't going to get stuck on something. That was my first audiobook that I had ever done. That mm -hmm. was for somebody else with a straight read where I did all the voices, and I was kind of not wanting to put my foot forward as if I'm an expert, I can do this without knowing that I could. So, yeah. and so we talked about looking ahead and knowing the story. So I was very conscious about that, but also pronunciation is key. If you have a fantasy story and you can't get feedback on how to say the names, you will not want to go back and have to redo the whole thing because the author re refuses to accept it unless you can say the wizard's name correctly mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. you have to make sure that you can get the information you need to be able to do the narration. Well, and I think it does affect the tone and emotion and because if you're not reading with confidence, if, if you if you're hesitating or stumbling over that word, it's going to show and it's going to kind of interrupt the flow of how you're talking. Mm -hmm. And I ran into that, uh, you know, especially in older stories, like if you're reading something from Edgar Allan Poe, you know, he, he would use a lot of bigger words or words that aren't used anymore in common language in our common speaking. And so I, I really had to spend a lot of time and in, in phonetically putting it in the text, like mm -hmm. you said so that I could read it correctly and it would flow. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, like they were saying, if you, can ask, if you can ask the author, you can't always ask the author. This is, again, kind of in the professional world, but you should always have a producer to ask how to pronounce the invented words. If you don't, if you're producing it yourself, um, figure out how you're going to say each thing and be consistent and say it the same way throughout. You can, get, you can get some words from dictionary.com. Yeah, there's a bunch of not, I've not names and not no. Street names, I mean, thing. if well, and things like you're talking about with the street names. Um, I did a book set in New York, and so there were a lot of references. And I'm you know native Californian. I've been to New York, but I'm not a New Yorker. And I knew some things like it's Houston, not Houston. You know, I knew that, but I wanted to make sure because there's a lot of New Yorkers or people familiar. And so if you're your first person narrator who supposedly lives there and you're mispronouncing the names of you know the popular delis or whatever, and we're really lucky with the internet because we do have a lot of resources. You can see things on YouTube. Um, I try to get news stories or people who live there to hear how they say it. Um, you can't always know, though. Okay, now we have an example. Oh. I was just going to say dictionary.com has sound files. Yeah, it does. Right. You go to dictionary.com, yeah. click the little speaker symbol. But there's, I've... Instead of just looking at the, you know, Right. Oh, no, definitely. And there's another one. Nothing. Forvo also has them. Like, they can have foreign words. And I have not found one source, though, that works for everything. Even dic even regular words. Like, I had one where dictionary.com's pronunciation was wrong. And they came back to me with that. And so I... Merriam-Webster has one also. So now I will check both places to see it's um it's crazy how you would i never realized pronunciation was so varied and there was so much to know about it i thought well i know how to say things we have an example of a sh passage from an upcoming dune story that i produced we've got the two uh, dune steef guys here <laughs> um rich outfield and big anklevich and they have a um session later on this afternoon with Abby Hilton and Lauren Harris about using humor in podcasts. But what I liked about this is these are real, this story takes place on Mars and these are real places. You know, these are names, they're not made up. And when they record, one of them reads while the other one listens and gives feedback so they can help each other with pronunciations. But it all sounds, you know, totally fluid. And I don't know that you guys mark things up ahead of time. Do you? Depends. Yeah. So we'll listen to this one real quick. And I can find my, there we go. 30 seconds later, she clipped the western edge of the atmosphere. Settlements at Cassius and Neath to the west, and on the Isidius and Elysium plains in the east, saw her as a flash of white and silver racing an arc across their skies as she ricocheted off the atmosphere and belted back. Why into, I, space. into space. Yeah, I'm not sure why my <laughs> clips are getting cut off. Um, but see, by having those pronunciations down cold, it flows. You know, it's all within. You, you're not pulled out because you're like, oh, that's a weird word. Um, now, I recently did a 
sci-fi fantasy book called Sword of Dreams, which had tons of made up names and terms. And um, I have a good relationship with that author. So I was able to get her pronunciations. This is just an example. I mean, this is a handful. There are pages of, of these things. And so what I ended up doing was going through and marking up the text like I was telling you about. And this is a full length novel. And I did a search and replace to put them in throughout the novel. And you can think, well, I'll remember how to pronounce that, but you might not. It's just easier to just have it there. And if you're used to it, you just, you don't notice it. You just read and you can get those audio cues. Yes, Abby? I would add that if you're sending these voice actors, this is what you want to do. Don't wait to look for the pronunciation on the page. Mm -hmm. Click on the thing, but right there, the text. Mm -hmm. And use rhymes with if you can. Yes. Well, in fact, I have that there. There's that N N Y T H word. And so I put rhymes with Sith just, speak, just to remind myself. And the, the stresses can be different, too. And in this case, the, where the um, stress syllable was, was often totally not what I thought it should be. So um, I would you know, do the all caps to remind myself to emphasize that syllable. Hey, can I have a drink? Across the table, Duol made a grab for Tiberius's glass. The old Priam pulled it back. The dark brown beer inside sloshed and foamed. Not a chance. You're too young, he said. I'm 20. Dual reached for it again. Come on, Captain. I've got a myth of a headache. You're 19. Tiberius took a long drink and wiped his mouth with the back of a hairy, scarred hand. In the Priam drinking age, Ah, it's 23. <laughs> so it's just cutting off. Yeah, I don't know why. It's, yeah, well, you know, that's technical stuff. <laughs> that's just how it goes. All right, well, um, now we're going to talk about during the recording, and this is, you know, sort of the heart of the whole thing. When you're doing fiction, there are different points of view, different ways the writing is done. First person, in my opinion, is the easiest type of fiction to get the tone and emotion correct because the narrator is a character and you're speaking as them. So people usually do this pretty easily because they're being that person and they're, I don't know, have you, what do you guys think about that? Whether it's easier to do. For have you had like people giving you first person narration that? Um, I, I like first person. I think of the first person as you're almost playing a character more than in third person. Mm -hmm. But third person, you still need to bring some personality to it. Yeah. But first person is a bit more obvious, especially when you're mixing dialogue with sort of thoughts and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Then it's kind of all the same, mm -hmm. same character. Yeah, I think as, as, as you read it, you resonate with it more as a, when you're saying I and me, because that... Uh, you know, you're you're used to talking about yourself, or like to talk about yourself. <laughs> yeah. So I have a few examples of first person first person narrations from various podcasts and audiobooks, and they're real short. But you can hear just how much the tone changes depending on who the narrator is and what's happening in the story. Great grandmother was born before. And she has many memories from that time. She talks about war and environmental horrors and diseases that couldn't be cured. Things we have all read about in our history modules. I was just kind of unwinding in the local tavern with a bottle of Antarian brandy and trying to figure out what to drink next after the last of it was gone, which figured to be mighty soon when a burly bearded man walked right up to me and tried to shove his nose up against mine. Which would have worked better if he hadn't been a little feller who was only three or four inches over six feet. <laughs> I feel more tired than I've ever felt and guess it's more about losing my parents than anything else. It's starting to sink in. This isn't a dream. Flint and I are alone and the sadness is so intense it makes me want to bury myself in the snow. I thought about saying, I told you so. I couldn't think of any reason to refrain. I told you so, I said. 
Shush it. Hala said, preoccupied, thinking, doing what Z did best, assessing complex problems and trying to figure out the easiest way to kill the source of those problems. So I let Zim be and didn't taunt further. While I remained motionless and busied in endeavors to collect my thought, the cold hand grasped me fiercely by the wrist, shaking it petulantly, while the gibbering voice said again, Arise! Did I not bid thee arise? Arise. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay, I'm going to let... <clears throat> excuse me, let these guys talk a little bit about this, sort of from the producer standpoint, but you can hear each one has a very distinct tone to how the reading comes across, and within each excerpt, the emotion can change depending on what they're saying. So, you want to talk about any of those? Because those are some of those are well, the ones one you did. In the middle of the Tusk one was me. That was an interesting story because it was a uh, the character's 12 years old, and it's set in the Ice Age, so it's it's sort of a kid's story. Um, uh, I think it was, sort of falls in the religion category if you were to go to uh, to Audible or something. But um, the main characters were a 12-year-old boy and an eight-year-old girl, and later there was an old man. And other than that, it was pretty much a first person from the the boy's point of view. So in order to do that, um, the little girl's voice, I went pretty high and was able, and and did that, but I didn't want to go overboard with the boy because that was going to be almost all the reading. So what I ended up doing was just using a soft voice. Um, so it, sa- it sounded younger in a sense, but at the same time, I wasn't going so far away from my normal voice that it was going to distract from my ability to bring emotion to it to, to be able to tell the story um, from that point of view. So it ended up working pretty well. I wasn't sure before I started, but mm-hmm. but it uh, ended up being a lot of fun to do it that way. Um, but yeah, kids are tough, that's for sure. Well, and it, I think with first person especially, it is acting. And we talked about knowing the story and knowing what's going to happen in the story and kind of knowing the motivations of your character. And uh, some of that, though, you, you might not be able to know from the text. And you, you kind of have to come up with a vision in your own mind of the emotion of this person or, or what they're going through and how they're going to react. And there might be dual emotions going on behind the scenes. And how would that come out if they were speaking? Mm-hmm. And I think, uh, you know, these are all good examples of, of that kind of... Yeah, the two of mine. I mean, the first, she's a young girl. So, and I don't, when I'm doing, we're all different in how we approach these things. For me, I don't think, okay, now I'm going to do my young girl voice. I just sort of try to say it as I think the character would say it. Um, with I did a little bit with the Dream Engine, so, which is a fabulous story. Um The main character is a genderless, bodiless entity. (laughs) And um, uh, Tim Pratt in the story, he uses Z and Zer instead of he, her, to, because it's hard to refer to somebody who's genderless and bodiless with a pronoun. But anyway, this character is Wisp, and Wisp is this kind of know-it-all type of a creature. And so, actually in this case, I did get a little inspiration or um, I guess motivation from thinking of C-3PO. That's kind of how I try, tried to, not, I didn't try to you know, mimic C-3PO, but just to put that kind of an attitude of, uh, yes, I know, you know, I know what to do. But it's, you know, it ends up sounding totally different. Now we're going to talk about third person. And just in my experience with producing and also listening to other narrators, this tends to be what's tougher for people to put the tone and emotion into. And I think that's because the narrator isn't a character in the story. It's um, an obvious character. So sometimes people don't seem to put a lot of life into the words they're saying, and I think, think it's because of that. This is where we often hear narrator voice, you know, sort of very official talking like this, you know, but without, you know, they're wanting to sound like a narrator, sound like this important narrator. Or, and if, or uh, you know, very announcery. Right, announcery, not, um, not drawing from what's being said, what the words are saying. 
So in my opinion, with third person, you still need to use the right tone of, to reflect the tone of what's happening in the story and the emotion of what's happening at that point in time. Yeah, I would say that with third person, the character is you. You're, <laughs> you're reading it as you telling a story. And you want this, even though it is you, you want the listener not to be thinking about you, that you want them to be visualizing the story. Mm -hmm. So you're going to want to deliver it in a way that you're, has emotion in it and, and you're reacting to things and you're using your voice and the way that you would react to things um, typically. There can be exceptions, of course. But. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I tend to think of the, the narrator as a character. It helps me. I mean, even though I'm mm -hmm. not, I don't have a stake in it necessarily, mm -hmm. but you know, I, I put myself in there as a character even though I'm narrating. And with some writing... And then, you know, this might just be a difference that we have with this. I think when it's a close third person narration, um, even though the narrator isn't saying I and me and our, you're still in that person's head, that point of view character who's telling the story. So I think in those cases, you do need to put almost as much emotion and into it as you would in first person. Um, when you're more removed from it, which happens sometimes, you know, there's maybe different points of view and the story is being told kind of from a separate storyteller perspective, then you would need to be more subtle. But you still, in my opinion, need to reflect kind of what's going on with, you know, if it's a happy story, you're not sounding really sad. And if it's scary, you're, you know, your voice is um, reflecting that. So. Yeah, there are some narrators that are very good. Narrators. I mean, they have a good, um, they have a good voice in it. When I say voice, I mean you know they they have a, a good character in their voice. But sometimes, even though they're a very good narrator, they do miss the tone, or they 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 tell all the stories in the same tone, and that 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 takes away from the story. You know? There's there's a difference between doing a voice and being a character. And some people make a living on doing voices. Um, and that's great, and it's very appropriate for certain kinds of audio. But when it comes to telling a story, it's really about being a consistent, <clears throat> convincing character. Uh, and it comes with confidence and experience. You just have to keep working at it, and it gets, gets easier and easier to do. So we're going to hear a few examples of third-person narration, um, and then we'll talk about them afterwards. He hated this part of the job, hated dealing with apparatchiks and functionaries, and of course the station master's office was full of them. A receptionist, and then a secretary, and then someone who was maybe the other kind of secretary, and then finally, Mongoose by now halfway down the back of his shirt and entirely hidden by his hair, and Irizari himself half stifled by memories of someone he didn't want to remember being, he was ushered into an inner room where Station Master Lee, her arms crossed and her round face set in a scowl, was waiting. Now Meta's body was repaired, good as new. In 57 years, she'd get it back. Never thought she'd miss the scrawny thing, but she did. She was beginning to develop a bad case of temporal claustrophobia. She'd only been serving her sentence for what, 24 hours? 57 times 365 minus one days to go, with nothing to entertain her but her own weak mind. that something was searching for him, something terrible, and it hurt his head and it made the muscles in his eyes twitch. But he dreamed that the thing wandered around inside his head and could not find him, that he changed beyond all recognition, that it looked him in the face and did not know him, and so withdrew, disappointed, still... Still searching. <laughs> <laughs> so... I chose these examples. The first, um, the first and the last are full cast productions where they have music and sound effects. And so the music definitely helps with the tone. But also if you hear how they are saying these things, and in the first case, you know, Mongus, which is another great story, um, what he's describing isn't really even that big of a deal, like a big of an emotional deal. It's not like he's about to be killed or, you know, his mom just died or something like that. He's just annoyed with bureaucracy and having to deal with, you know, the sort of uh, paperwork types of stuff that go along with his job. 
but in the voice, in Norm's voice, you hear that annoyance, you know, it could have been read totally flatly. It wasn't like a big part of the story, but I just think that makes it so much in more interesting to listen to and just brings you into the world so much more to hear what's being said on the text reflected in the person's voice. Um, same with, you know, Boxed, which is a st another story I had a lot of fun doing. Um, but this, you know, she's upset, she's annoyed, she's frustrated. In this case, this is another disembodied character who's been um, sentenced. Her brain, her mind is sentenced to be in this box for 57 years. And so she's doing a lot of reflecting. And, you know, it's not first person. It's not I feel this way or I want to do this. It's she, she, she. But you can still bring that emotion into what you're saying. Um, and then Abby's story, Abby's here, the Guild of the Cowrie Catchers, um, and hers is also full cast, so she has different character voices and she just does the narration. She has her point of view character, Gerard, and we're seeing the story through his eyes, and this is just a terrible time for him. And her voice, the way she reads what is being said reflects what the words actually say. So, yeah. this, have anything to add about third person? I just, yeah, these are great examples of, you know, you know, it almost feels like first person because the emotion is there. And even though you're not saying I and me and we or whatever, you are getting that um, just as if it was a character. But mm -hmm. yeah, you can have as much variation in third person as first person, in the types of characters that, that you end up playing. And it, it, it's you're setting a mood you're either you're speaking quickly and getting you know you can you can make a story much more exciting and, and energetic or you can tone it down and make it sad or, or whatever and it's really your emotion that that does that yeah and I guess that's that's true with like fight scenes you yeah. know I've noticed you know um, helping I mean if you underlay music of course that helps but just the narration of it you, you tend to speed up and you tend to jump here and there and a little more clippy than you would be if you were just talking about going to a social gathering or something like that. You can bring that in. Yeah. So now we're going to talk about how to do this. And this, to me, this is the most important thing, and that's to pay attention to what you are saying. To not be thinking about, gosh, you know, did I... Um, Turn the iron off. Actually, I would never think that because I don't iron. <laughs> but I was, I was just trying to think of something that um, that you know might be like, oh no, you know, I needed to do X, Y, Z. You need to keep your mind on the story and what you're saying. Um, so don't let your mind wander. I have had. I, it's hard, especially if you're doing a whole novel. It's hard to do that. It's only natural for your mind to wander. And I've had a producer come back to me and say, you know, Renee, this part it just doesn't sound like how you normally do it and um, you know would you mind doing it again and I said okay and then I when I saw what the clip was I was like it was sort of a flashback kind of thing and as I was reading it I thought have I already recorded this I, that's what I was thinking I was like it sounds pretty much the same but it's not quite exactly the same. that's where my mind was it wasn't on the story itself um, now this is another one where p different people might have different approaches um, I think it's better if you don't put on a voice, like this is my old man voice, this is my little kid voice, this is my um, butler voice. I think, I mean, you know, our minds are complicated, we can think of more than one thing at once, but I think the focus needs to be on the character and what they're saying and why, how they're feeling, just all of that. And really, I mean, I'm not the type of, some people are great at voices, I'm, you know, decent at it, but really what I mostly try to do is just to be that person. and. Often if you understand them and as you're reading, the voice kind of just naturally develops like what they sound like. Now this is something that we'll um, talk more about in a little bit, but sometimes when you're doing one of these readings, and this is for those of us who record alone and don't have a friend to <laughs> listen to us and give us direction, like I'll, I will read something and I'll think, okay, no, that, was, that wasn't right. That just wasn't the right way to do it. And so redo it. You know, you can, I if you guys went to Scott Sigler's um, presentation this morning, but that's the great thing about digital audio is you're not limited. You can, you know, make, you can, your raw recording can be, you know, two times as long as what the final product ends up being. So, um, if you're editing yourself, you might not need to do this, but what I do when I'm editing for other, or reading for other people is I say, I'm going to do that again, and then I just do it again. 
Just Ian, you're not paying for studio time. I mean, you can right. you can take as much time as you need to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and mistakes are uh, just a few mistakes can really hurt you. So, uh, it, and it can be very frustrating when you go back to produce what you've read, and you realize that you read a line four times. The first three, you kind of realize, oh wait, I was pronouncing that wrong. And then you rush through the last time, got the word right, and realize that the, later that the take was horrible. And then you're stuck in a point where you're trying to take a word and put it into the other sentence with the exact timing that makes it sound like you said it, which sometimes works, or you have to do the whole that section again, which is difficult to do because <coughs> your recording environment, even, even if your recording environment is consistent from day to day, which not everyone can easily do, um, your voice changes from day to day. And it, uh, whether it's later in the recording session or earlier, you'll, you can hear audiobooks, even the most professional narrators, you hear that point where the day ended and then the new day starts because their voice suddenly changes. Usually they'll do it at chapters, but sometimes it's right in the middle of a paragraph. Um, so it's very important to minimize those changes. And to do that, you have to repeat a sentence, even if it takes you 12 times and you're getting mad and you have to curse at the top of your lungs just to get it out of your system and then overemphasize the word three times and then go back, take a deep breath and then say it with the right tone and say the line again and not screw it up. And <laughs> it, you will be so frustrated if you go back and realize that you never did a single take that was good enough. Mm -hmm. And that leads us right into post recording. Um, <laughs> This isn't always your job. Sometimes you're just they just want you to do the recording and give it to them and they'll fix it. And producers vary with what they want. Some producers want different options, especially if you're doing voice work for a full cast production. Like when I'm producing full cast, I like to have different ways. I ha like to have the voice actor say the same line in a few different ways. The reason for that is it makes it easier to match up so that you ha if you have another character and say one of them is really kind of sounding sad and tired and the other one is like really intense, the dialogue doesn't go together well. Um, so, but if you have options, then you can usually match up the dialogue pretty well. But then there are other producers who don't like that <laughs> and they just want you to just do your line and move on to the next. So um, if you have a rapport with the producer and can find that out, uh, do it. But sometimes you don't know, like with the orange example, like I just didn't know which was the way to go with it, so I did it both ways. Okay, now we're going to talk about multiple takes versus retakes, and that's, you know, goes back to what we were just talking about with, with while you're doing your recording session, if trying to get it as right and perfect as you can at that point. So the first, I'm going to really let Brian and Marshall take over on this section because um, they are they have more experience with all this than I do. Yeah, the thing to understand um, as a narrator uh, and as a producer is that it's about the pacing that you end up with at the end, not the pacing you had when you recorded. Um, and I think a lot of people don't seem to understand this. It's much better if you have a block of text to do each sentence with long pauses in between until you get each sentence right. Uh, and I can ha be, as the producer, I can get the timing so it feels like a perfect flow right through the whole thing. But a lot of times people see a block of text and they don't even take a breath between sentences. And it's very hard because they're not even using periods and commas to determine where their stopping points are. Like the, I mean, if you can imagine like you're, you don't see a break, you, it's just sort of, your waveform is a block and like a word just bled into the beginning of the next word and it's so hard when you do that a little differently with each take to put different takes together to get your timing down. So it's important to take it slow and worry about one sentence at, one sentence at a time. If you screw up a line or a word, know where your pauses were, and I think this will be a, a bullet point on here, know where your pauses were so that you at least continue from where the pause was because if you continue uh, at the beginning of a sentence where the previous take you had sort of bled through, there's no way to fit that together and make it sound natural. So you end up having to try to cut something off and fade it in a way that sounds just right. It's so much work for a producer that if, if you're a voice actor, you want to be very careful about when your pauses are. Let 
the pacing be worried about by the producer. And breaths can be that way also. So before I start to read, I take a breath and then I wait for a beat and then I start because if it's <laughs> getting that like last little bit of breath trying to get rid of that can be hard so having that blank space can yeah. help and lip smacks those, yeah those happen um you can kind of see them in the waveform uh, as a producer what you'll do as a producer is um one thing you'll be told you're, you're chopping up the your wave file um and you're going to be figuring out the timing like you might have a second and a half between sentences or a second between sentences and between paragraphs you might do something like three seconds you sort of get a feel for how it should be based on the narrator um, but in order to do that, you're not just cutting it and moving stuff. You, you, you need to have sort of a room tone silence that never goes away. You can't suddenly drop to no file there and then back to the room tone. Even though you're minimizing the room tone as much as you can, uh, what you end up doing is noise reducing the whole thing, taking a little half second clip, mm -hmm. and that's going to get pasted over your lip smacks, your breaths, and things like that. And it's that same. You want to make sure that half second you pick doesn't have something in the background right. or some noise or else you'll just hear it repeating whenever yeah. you used it. But but you're going to be using that half second mm -hmm. all the time to mm -hmm. cover up breaths and things like that. That's the best technique to, to improve on. Well, people have different things that they do. The, the lip smacks really chapstick helps the most for that, but there are other mouth noises that you might not realize you've been making all your life until you're listening to yourself, you're recording. It's just stickiness in your mouth, so um, hydration is super important. I always brush my teeth right before I'm going to record, just because having a clean mouth seems to help. Um, some people use eat apples because supposedly something in the skin just helps. Um, <laughs> well, yeah. I've never caught on to it mm -hmm. until. Right, until you hear it. I'll do the, I'll do the moisture. Mm -hmm. I bet that's what it is because I have a tendency to keep my mouth closed because I'm mm -hmm. conscious of it. Right, right. So I think even in my private state, maybe mm -hmm. I'm probably pursing my lips. Mm -hmm. And then I can. Yeah. The, well, and once you hear yourself doing the lip smacks, you'll stop doing them as much. The mouth noises can be harder because they're sort of out of your control. Um, but what I do is when I'm narrating a lot, I take every page or two, I, and I drink tea, hot tea, um, pretty much as hot as I can stand it without burning my mouth. Mm -hmm. And that helps relax my throat also. So that gives a good sound. Plus it keeps you hydrated and just keeping your um, mouth hydrated. <laughs> I mean, that's really the most important thing. Well, then, uh Scott Sigler said this morning that pineapple juice um, helps yeah. open up your throat as well. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I would that you hear like lemon yeah. juice, like sort of making having the opposite effect. So I don't. I mean, there people are different. I was uh, lucky enough to take a class where Scott Brick was one of the teachers. I don't know if you know of him. He's a very prolific audiobook narrator. But what he does is he gets little those little bottles of breath freshener that not the spray banaka kind of stuff but they're like little squeeze bottles you get them at like gas stations and things and he just every two pages he takes a drink he does his lip balm and he puts a drop of that on his tongue and that just kind of stimulates your mouth to produce saliva and then you're yeah but really that's the most the hydration is the most important thing it, there's a there's a balancing act because you don't want to eat something just before a lot of foods will make your mouth make sounds um yeah. even if you know i don't know which foods i'd have to think mm -hmm. about it, but but you have a, the opposite problem where if your stomach starts growling in the middle of the recording uh that's very frustrating because you have no control over when that will happen yeah so, so you want to have eaten beforehand but not just beforehand you want to have some water at hand you don't want to drink a big coffee or something that's really going to make your mouth dry right because yeah that's going to make so much noise mm -hmm. and it's just frustrating to have to it's try trial that. and error really just yeah. what works for you but yeah. um i don't read i don't coach mm -hmm. so i have to submit the audio file uh -huh. and i'm a perfectionist because mm -hmm. eventually that company is going to send it to the ultimate person who mm -hmm. does a kind of coach phone call mm -hmm. and i always hear myself i'm probably just not even i'm yeah. Caught up in my own mm -hmm. But I think the hydration would help a lot with that. Um, I think and what you said, you cut out the breaths. Usually. Are those noted? Are every breath you take out, they, they, no. that is audible? 
Not every, but I'd say 90%. Um, because that's distracting to you, or because it's a, you can tell when somebody's about to take a long sentence, or what? Uh, the main thing is you want, the the, one of the biggest concerns when you're dealing with doing the pacing, is, especially if you're doing different voices, is the fact that someone will be pulled out of the story if something impossible happens. If you switch voices too quickly, you need, it, it just rips you out. Mm -hmm. But if you put a second in between, you can have an extreme volume change, and it's believable because you can imagine them taking a breath and bang, saying it. But if you have a breath in there, you're hearing the transition. So it's, silence is better than ha hearing something sometimes in order to make the transition believable. You don't need to take all the breaths out, especially for a narrator. Um, or a scene where uh, there's a dramatic pause and you want to hear the, the actor is really thinking about mm -hmm. something, it's great to have the, the sounds and the, and the breathing in there. But I find that um, I'm pulling out a lot of breaths when I, when I do narration. It really seems to depend on the person and how they do their <laughs> recording. Like Norm Sherman, for example, you hear his breaths all the time, yeah. but they are part of, it's almost... <laughs> It's just part of how he communicates. When I am narrating, I'm better than I used to be, but I will run out of air, you know, kind of mid sense. I take a huge breath, <laughs> and then that's when the pause comes in, and then you start, and that you would and take out <laughs> because it would not be natural. But if it's like going within the flow of what you're saying, you can keep it in. There's different schools of thoughts with audiobooks. So in the US, the standard just real quick, the standard is to take the breaths out. In the UK, it's not. They leave the breaths in. And um, we were listening to, I went to this audio publishing conference, and we were listening to Neil Gaiman's, um, I think it was American Gods, I'm not sure which one it was, but they were presenting that as this great example. And the American narrators in the audience were just like, well, but we hear all the breaths. So it's mm -hmm. kind of a personal preference thing also. Um, uh, Abby, I'm sorry. I was just going to say there's something in between. You can run with the volume. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, so you're not, if it doesn't work to totally cut it out, if that's going to make for too jarring of a sound, you can reduce the volume, and that way it's not as noticeable. If the breath is there and it's not distracting, I tend to leave it. Mm -hmm. But I'm very, I, I'm listening for anything that's going to, be a distraction, so so it doesn't take much for me to decide to decide to get rid of it. Okay. Uh, one thing that uh, you know, we said that uh, it's edit editing. The editing process is not always your job, but for me, I learned to narrate better when I started editing my own narration, and so I, I learned what the problems were better. So, you know, anybody that uh, that wants to narrate, I would. Mm -hmm. I would encourage yeah. them to edit themselves for a little bit so that they know what a producer is going to be looking for. Well, and if you're putting together demos and things like that, I mean, maybe you have a friend who's an audio expert who can do that for you, but usually people have to kind of figure that out themselves. Also, if you get a, ever get an opportunity to na uh, edit another narrator, that is really helpful also because you just mm -hmm. hear how other people other people do it and you can get ideas of what how you want to do things and how you don't. We are at the four minute mark till we're done. Does anyone have any other questions? No? All right, well did you guys have anything else you wanted to add? Um, just that it comes down to confidence and practice. Um, when I started out, I did, my first story I ever did was a Dune Steve and I narrated it and I listened back and there are things in the production that bother me probably more than the narration itself, but, but everything is, is a learning curve and so, um, you learn by doing. That's that's pretty much how it works. So we've all done quite a bit by now. Uh, and the unfortunate thing with podcasting is your learning curve is out there. So <laughs> people can hear it. Your early stuff, <laughs> hear how you progress. Might judge you on it. <laughs> but um, the key is to just always try to get better and be very critical of yourself and do the best that you can. And you'll find that, um, like the the audio books that I did, I had no idea what the response would be like, or if I, you know, I had never done. Uh, I, I'd done plenty of narration by then, but I had never done the voices and I had no idea how I was going to feel about doing that. Uh, and both of the authors who had commissioned me were just um, glowing reviews when I submitted it and I was kind of humbled and surprised by how happy they were with it um, because I, 
as you started off with this, I, I'm critical of my voice. I think it's terrible sometimes. <laughs> um, but when you get good at it, uh, it just becomes natural, and it, it's just fun to tell stories. I mean, it's why we do it. So. And I'll let you, I just want to jump in super quick. If you're the type of person like me where I get very self-conscious and kind of embarrassed, about the fact that I can't, I have to have like sort of a split personality and I cannot think that people are going to be listening to what I'm doing or I just freeze up and freak out. So in that case, like the comp, like be confident, like that wouldn't work for me. But what works for me is the story, focusing on the story. And I think that helps a lot with the tone and emotion, like I said, but it also helps with just kind of distracting yourself from the fact that people are going to be listening <laughs> to what to you and um, it just helps me a lot is just to keep my mind my attention on the actual story anything else yeah it's just uh, have fun too yeah it I mean, is it's, fun yeah. it's a lot of fun it doesn't have to be mm -hmm. as, as torturing no just... oh. thanks everyone <clears throat> we appreciate you being here. Okay. Okay, so there's that uh, panel for you. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, one thing that they said for us to to uh, sem to always mention when we uh, when we put these out is to say this is a panel that you missed by not attending the New Media Expo, and they wanted us to go out and tell everybody how great it was so that they'll come next year because apparently next year is going to be bigger and better, and it'll be bigger because Big Anklevich will be there again. And he'll have gone off his diet, so he will be bigger also. <laughs> uh, we went to a panel, a technical panel, from a, a guy who talked about how to do podcasts. And he was talking, he said something that really interested me, where he said that <clears throat> there tend to be way more female bloggers than male bloggers. But there are infinitely more male podcasters than there are female podcasters. Do you? Can you remember off the top of your head the crazy number? Oh, it's... Bloggers to podcasters. There's 3,600 female bloggers for every one female podcaster there is out there. He said 51% of bloggers are female. And my math's not strong, so but, but I'll say that's about half. Uh, but of how many podcasters are female? 12.5%. Uh, and so he said that if you're a blogger especially a female blogger, and you really want to make your blog unique, or I, I believe what he said is make it pop, which I don't know what that means. Again, a sexual term. Um, <laughs> then w consider adding a podcast to your blog uh, or, or, you know, just recording a couple of things and putting it on there so people can listen to it. There's something about the, the human voice that endears you to someone. Um, you know, there have been a couple of times when, you know, you'll read something by somebody and, and it, it it gives you an impression, but then actually hearing them read it or hearing them talk or, or somebody that narrates their own audiobook, you get an image of who that person is. You start to feel like you know that person. You know, like if you listen to Neil Gaiman read his own author's note from his book or whatever, it's like, oh, there's Neil, my the guy that I know right. talking kind of thing. And, and I... I, I, he didn't, the, the Libsyn guy didn't say this, but that's something that I took away from it is if you want to create this feeling of familiarity, of, of almost friendship, consider voicing it. Hence, the stuff that Renee and Brian and Marshall were saying in that panel you just heard is kind of invaluable. You know, how you speak and how you convey the feeling when you, when you talk and uh, reading it ahead of time. Anyway, th those guys are really good at what they do. Renee is a professional audiobook narrator. And so uh, I was glad I went to the panel, even though they were my friends. Yeah, it was worth listening to. Okay, so we'll be back again with our own panel shortly. That gets my go is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 license. So I was really trying to give content to that. You know what I mean? Yeah, you, you took it way too far, sir.